Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of the NewMexicoMercury.com. I'm here today with old colleague and old friend, uh, political scientist Richard Fox, who's, who's been a writer in New Mexico about New Mexico issues for many decades, and a person whose opinion I, I greatly trust and, uh, and actually admire. Um, so it's wonderful to have him here today. We're going to talk a little bit about um, the all-important upturn... Uh, upcoming uh, New Mexico House of Representative races. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the context of, of a midterm election uh, and uh, the general nature of what's, what's going down in our, our state at the moment. We'll also deal a little bit with these contradictory polls over the governor's race. So, Richard, it's great to have you here. Great to see you. It's good to be back at the Mercury after a long summer of Fun and frolic. <laughs> now it's time to talk about the blood sport, uh, New Mexico politics. Yeah. Nice to see you. So let's start right off quickly uh, in terms of the blood sport. I think it's wonderful. Talking about uh, the uh, uh, the recent polls, the Rasmussen poll had had uh, Attorney General King tied with Governor Martinez. The the uh, uh, recent Journal poll, um, which is of course, is run by the journal itself because it owns the majority holding it in the polling company, has the governor uh, nine points ahead. Uh, how is the normal <laughs> uh, citizen supposed to uh, uh, look at such things? And, and how do we judge the veracity of these polls? Survey, survey research has become... Um, extraordinarily complex and very expensive. However, there's some things that, that um, everybody needs to remember. Um, first, the, both of these polls, in my judgment, are very credible. Um, I don't know the, the specifics of each methodology, but Research and Polling Inc. and Rasmussen are both very credible pollsters. Um, the the poll, any poll, is essentially a snapshot of a momentary point in time. And that's all it is. Um, the key to successful polling and meaningful polling, credible polling, is, of course, the analysis that goes with it and knowing what the methodology is that was taken by the pollster. Um, the... The credibility of a poll, in my judgment, is determined by things like the size of the sample, the degree of randomness, um, the questions, the number of questions, uh, what the questions ask, and, of course, who gets asked. And, and um, um, I think each one of these polls are certainly, uh, both of them are credible. Uh, they are, however, contradictory. And I think that the contradictory nature of these two polls reflects the, the fickle nature in high summer of the electorate, uh, whether it be in New Mexico or, or some other state or across the country. Uh, I think it re represents the fickleness of the of the electorate. Also, polling is becoming more difficult because there are, uh, uh, there, there are new variables. Um, one, of course, is the cell phone. Um, the other, of course, is the time that these polls were taken. Again, high summer. Um, all polls have, have biases. Nothing in politics, nothing in media, nothing in, certainly, even in survey research good survey research, is perpendicular. Right. <laughs> there, there, is, there is no such thing. The, the question becomes, are these, are these fair biases? Are the biases fair? Uh. And whether it be in, in uh, argument or political discourse or whatever, you have, to, you have to understand there will be bias, but they have to be fair bias. And the public needs to be able to detect those biases. Um, in, a, in an electorate full of low-information voters, full of cynical voters, 
full of apathetic voters, full of anti-politician voters, full of anti-leadership voters. And as I'll talk about in a minute, uh, in an argument culture, um, people are genuinely skeptical, not only of the poll results, but they're they're very wary and, and sometimes deceptive of what they tell a pollster or what they tell someone calling for a pollster. Um, it's getting more and more difficult to, to reach people. Um, it's getting, it, you have to make more calls to get a sample that is random enough. You have to make more calls. This is more expensive. So we see, at least in New Mexico, we see fewer polls, fewer political polls. Uh, we have a lot of marketing research yeah. going on all the time in this consumer-oriented culture. Um, as far as these two polls go, I think that um, the contradiction makes perfect sense. I, I think that um, at the time the Rasmussen poll was taken, which was in July, um, that's probably the moment when it was 43 all, very fluid. Uh, in August, when the uh, Research and Polling Inc. poll was done for the journal, um, 50 Susanna, 50 percent for Susanna, 41 for uh, Attorney General Gary King, is probably um, uh, an accurate sap snapshot of that particular moment. So you have you have contradictions, and I think that's where we are. Uh, in, again, in high summer. So you started to touch a little bit upon the, uh, the argument, uh, a culture that, that we now live in, and a tiny bit about the, uh, the general context of a, mid, of a midterm election uh, that is filled with very important local races, from land commissioner to state auditor to state attorney general to governor. Um, uh, so could you sort of reflect a little bit more on the nature of these midterm elections. As far as the midterms go, we're, we're confronted with, uh, we're confronted with the same old questions, the same old, frankly, issues and problems. Um, let me see if I can put a, a, a fresh uh, set of remarks on, on what is essentially the same old winner, loser, zero-sum political environment. Um, an environment, a political environment that produces winners and losers. There are three questions that persist in, in, uh, in the political environment. Um, and they, they persist in this election. One is, this is for each party, the Democrats and Republicans. The question that they have to answer, it seems to me, is whose income Whose income and standard of living do you and your party plan to reduce to solve the economic and social problems facing us? That's question number one. In a zero-sum winner-loser environment, somebody's income and standard of living, especially in New Mexico, is going to be reduced. And we're seeing this play out in the nation as well. Second. Um, how will you and your administration, thinking of the governor, whoever the, the governor will be, um, who, or how will you and your administration dis distribute the benefits and burdens um, produced by New Mexico's weak economy and state government? How is it going to be distributed? We hope equitably. Um, that's, a, that's a very important question, it seems to me. In New Mexico, who will pay? And I don't just mean in taxes or in money costs. Who will pay? Who will sacrifice? And who will benefit? In the years ahead, in tough economic, social, and environmental times. Who will pay? Who will sacrifice? Who will benefit? That's an important question for these candidates. And you know, I hope that somehow it'd be reflected in the in the uh, in the in the debates. In other words, it's um, 
what I think the greatest moral philosopher of the, of the late 20th century said, John Rawls. It becomes a question of, of I mean, if you're really thinking uh, at an ethical, moral, political level, um, what, what do we say to the losers? In fact, Professor Rawls spent most of his life trying to answer that question. What do we say to the losers? After all the political outcomes have been, have been made and seen and all the rest of it, um, what do we say during the legislative session coming up or next year or five years? What do we say to the losers? And, and those are important questions. I mean, it's always, my question is always, we'll hope will hope triumph over experience. And I think deep down, that's probably all of everyone's question. Will hope triumph over experience. So um, the argument culture. We have, uh, I think New Mexico has a set of about 15 problems. Um, they're not new. <clears throat> In fact, they're quite old. 15 problems that persist. Um, maybe we make some incremental progress. Maybe we <coughs> don't. Maybe they get worse. But there's a lot of static sort of stasis when it comes to these, these 12 or 14 problems. Um, poverty, of course. A weak economy, high school dropouts, unemployment, underemployment, teen pregnancy, Domestic violence, alcohol and drug abuse, uh, overstretched DAs, a weak criminal justice system, violent crime, suicide, welfare abuse. And I'm reading from a list in my notes. <clears throat> Tax cheating, thousands still without health insurance. Gambling addiction, diabetes, a struggling education system. Homicide, an abscessed APD. Um, and, of course, infrastructure. And then we could take those problems and go into, into, into issues. Yeah. Climate change, the environment, water is an enormous issue. Um, education, immigration, minimum wage increase, tax reform, infrastructure, the future itself. All of these problems play out or not. In, in, in what's called an argument culture. Americans don't like to talk about politics because invariably, even you know, around the dinner table or around the Thanksgiving table or around the Christmas tree, people don't like to talk about politics or religion because it becomes, uh, despite mighty efforts to keep it away, becomes adversarial and becomes argumentative and makes people nervous. Yeah. This translates into a campaign where a lot of rank and file voters or people don't like to talk about it, it because it's argumentative often. <clears throat> there is a term called agonism. Agonism is A-G-O-N-I-S-M, agonism. And agonism is a, um, uh, I think, I'm sure, I know it comes from the Greek. Uh, agonism is taking a warlike stance, you see, in conversation, yeah. taking a warlike stance when there literally is no war. And, and um, um, this pervades our public and private discourse and conversation. When our discourse isn't empty, it's rancid. And again, this is public and private. When it's not empty, it's rancid. And it becomes very adversarial. Now this, what this does is it winds up making it very difficult to solve problems. And when you have high stakes, big stakes in an election, um, who's going to govern? Power is the issue. It becomes very difficult to solve problems and it, and it corrodes I think it corrodes the human spirit. And when people in an argument culture, which is most of us, which is most of us, I mean, even if you don't give a damn about politics, um, it makes individuals feel like in the domain of politics and media, 
that they have no, there's no way they could gain any influence. There's no way that they could influence uh, politics or change, so they don't engage in it. They walk away, they, they stay away. Fear, anxiety, cynicism, apathy, and they simply turn away. All our politics, and, and we're talking about New Mexico today, Albuquerque, we, we could talk about it certainly in the nation, which plays out every day on cable television. I mean, networks have been built on agonism. Absolutely. Networks, television networks have been built on this idea of you take two extreme positions and you get people arguing with each other, sometimes shouting, sometimes coming out of their chair. Uh, with their hair on fire. And then out of that, those two extremes, you get, somehow you get a balance. And you get uh, a purveying of, we hope, which often or rarely happens, you, you, you're supposed to get insight out of that. Right. And it simply does not happen. But it, it, it's, it's, it's an argument culture. And that's, how our, that's the culture in which our politics plays out. I got really interested in what you said earlier on about what do you say to the losers, or how do you, or what do you give to the losers in a zero-sum election, uh, which all elections are. Uh, but we always have to remember that even if somebody wins by two or three percentage points, there's everybody else left over who didn't vote for them. Uh, so who do you think the Martinez administration sees as the losers? the burdened, not the benefited. And conversely, could you see that uh, for, the, for the, uh, the King administration, the King would be administration? If you were to ask um, Governor Martinez or candidate King, or really any, any uh, uh, electoral politician, um, who Whose income and, and standard of living are you going to reduce to solve the economic and social problems facing us? They all would say the same thing in some form. They would say nobody. <laughs> nobody. Nobody's going to get. Uh, nobody's going to lose if 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 I get elected. Um, everybody's going to get well if if I'm elected. Um, but we know that's. And they won't be lying. They won't be lying. Um, that is death to a politician to say, well, if you elect me, um, um, VB Price, if you elect me, your taxes are going to go up. And to say to someone who has nothing, poor, uneducated or poorly educated, desperate, um, if you, if I'm elected, you're going to stay that way. They never get any votes. They give up the game. So the way to look at this is, is that the, the, the people who are losing now, beginning with the middle class, which is the Democrats' current problem, bucking up, bucking up the middle class uh, economically is, is a problem for the Dems. Um, and the people who are losing now, beginning with the middle class, all the way down, are going to continue to lose in this political environment. This is why we have no transformative candidates. We have no, we have transactional candidates. Vote for me, support me, and I'll support you in X, Y, Z ways. Um, but let's look at it as to who the winners are or who the appeal is made to, essentially. Um, if you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics and if you look at the Census Bureau, and I'm sure if you looked at, you went up to Anderson uh, or you talked to someone like Lee Rainus or somebody, you could find these numbers. I found them. Um, today in New Mexico, the top 1%, clearly the winners, uh, enjoy 72.6% of the state's economic growth. Top 1%. Wow. Now, in New Mexico, that's a relatively small number of people yeah. in this state. Damn a low, uh, a less populated state. 
in America. Between 1979 and 2007, roughly 30 years, 28 years, 30 years, New Mexico's economic growth was only 14%. The growth of the state in percentage terms. That's the seventh lowest in America. Seventh lowest. Between the same period, 79 to 07, 99% of the state's population um, saw only 4.2% economic growth. No kidding. Wow. It all went to the top. It all went to the top. That's the eighth lowest in America. Jeez. And finally, between 79 and 07, 73% of the economic growth, 73%, almost three quarters, went to the top 1%. Now, those are the winners, the real winners. Yeah, the real winners. In a struggling, when you have struggling working people and you have a struggling middle class uh, whose status economic status is 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 being uh, is being eroded. Now when we look at economic growth, our great I think our great really misperception, mistake maybe is we measure everything in America by GDP or economic growth. But that that doesn't tell us how we're really doing in terms of social health. It doesn't tell us we have economic growth. In fact, we, we have, we do have economic growth. It's slow growth. It's anemic growth. But it's, and it's slow, but it's growth. And we mistake change. We mistake change in the GDP or in economic growth in a state like New Mexico. We mistake it for progress. We think that we're making, we think we're making progress if it changes, at, that is to say, if it increases. But we're not making progress. We have enormous the country does. We have enormous inequality. Yeah. Enormous. The gap is 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 huge. And as I think this is well known. Um, so we get economic growth, albeit weak. But we also get enormous inequality. Right up to the one percent. Most of it, certainly most of it. And of course, the one percent is where it becomes the ownership of the country. It becomes uh, the power source. And when you throw in some other things like, you know, the the top 10% uh, own 90% of all stock in America. Uh, And there there are other things. We've, I think some of them we touched on in earlier Mercury uh, discussions. But this leads us to, uh, and maybe we can talk about this in a minute, um, to what I think is the Democrats' problem. It seems to me, Richard, that if um, if the New Mexico House of Representatives happens to go to the Republicans, who are, in my judgment, the champions of the one percent, uh, and if Susanna Martinez be, uh, is reelected, um, we'll see who the vast majority of losers are. Which will be you and me and everybody in our audience and everybody who can't afford a computer to see us. That house race is really critical, and I'd I'd love you to, uh, uh, before we get to the Democrats' problem, which I would like to do, because obviously if uh, if they're about to, if they're even in danger of losing the house, that's part of their problem. Uh, What is the prospect of uh, a Democratic majority uh, remaining in the house? And... um, What's the prospect for the other possibility? Let's take that up. Let's look at the let's look at the New Mexico House. Um, because I've I've identified about ten swing districts um, where you have um, essentially vulnerable incumbents, both Democrats and Republicans. Mm-hmm. But but the one thing to remember is, is that is that the Democrats have more seats to defend, right. and and um, that of course is a, is a is a factor, um, and we could look at that the reasons retirements and defeats in uh, uh, you know and victories in twenty twelve and all the rest, but 
since 1967, there there have been there are 70 seats in the New Mexico House of Representatives since 67, um, 70. And there's there's been a recent, um, relatively recent study by uh, by uh, Professor Nolan McCarty at Princeton, and another professor at at, at the University of Chicago, Boris Shore. Um, who looked at state legislatures, and they were looking, among other things, at polarization. And at the moment, the Democrats have a 37 to 33 seat edge, so the Republicans need a net gain of at least four. Um, in New Mexico. In New Mexico. In New Mexico. Um, what McCarty and Shore found was that New Mexico, the New Mexico legislature, um, is one of the most polarized wow. in the country. Wow. And, of course, I saw this uh, way back in the, and you know, I was up there about 10 years in the 80s. And what, what saves the legislature, of course, uh, in terms of doing its work, is, is, are, of course, coalitions. In the 1980s, um, when at one point a barrel of oil cost 11 bucks, uh, it was the it was the cowboy coalition, a, co a coalition of of mostly uh, conservative Democrats or moderate Democrats, some liberals. There weren't many liberals at that point, and and uh, and Republicans in in coalescing and compromising. Right. But the overall, the overall um, um, sort of patina or complexion of, of the legislature <clears throat> with, with coalitions is, is still, in New Mexico, is still uh, conservative. Oh, yes, we, in the, historically we've had the Mama Lucy's and we've had liberals, but, but, but it's, it's always been this combination of, of urban legislators and rural legislators and business and ranchers and farmers, um, you know, who meet in January and February when there's nothing else to do on the ranch. Um, and so you have that urban-rural split, which still exists. Yeah, for sure. Um, but that's how we get through the night, is with coalitions to compromise. Um, we're one of the most polarized in the nation, according to McCarty and Shore. And only California, Michigan, Colorado are worse or more polarized than, than New Mexico, um, according, to, according to this study. Uh, Rhode Island is the least polarized. Uh, and Rhode Island, Rhode Island, believe me, has a lot of problems. Yeah. But the, the reason is because they're all overwhelmingly, it's overwhelmingly democratic. In Rhode, it's a democratic state. Um, also, some people would think a divided legislature, where you have one one uh, party controlling the Senate, say, and the other controlling the House, and maybe uh, a party controlling the governor's office. Um, some people like that. Now, right now, we have uh, a legislature that's that's um, largely controlled. Controlled is a is a touchy word in political science. I don't like the word control. It should be used advisedly. But um, right now we have both houses with, with Democratic majorities, and we have a Republican governor. Well, some people like that. They think divided government um, uh, is a good check and balance. Well, maybe so, but except when you, when you can't get anything done, yeah, right. when it becomes dysfunctional. Now, we're not, we're not there yet in Santa Fe with our legislature. We're not, we're not, we're not at dysfunction. Uh, there was a, a a Yale political scientist some years ago, David Mayhew, who wrote a book about about the value of a divided legislature. He was talking about the Congress. Hmm. I, I'm not so sure. I think the current House, New Mexico House, reflects pretty much. And if you talk to certainly, if you talk to Democratic. Uh, Hispanic legislators, legislators, they will say this. I think right now the, the New Mexico House pretty much reflects the diversity of the state. If you look at the, the this list of 70 who are up there, it's pretty much. Yeah. Um, 
in the House, you have you have um, extremes, you have extremists, you have moderates, you have compromisers. The, the question is, do you have problem solvers and people who can actually legislate? I mean, legislating is an art, in part. And we know the cliches about sausage making and all the rest of it. But but good legislating over time is is an art, like fundraising. And maybe like polling, it's an art form yeah. to be really good at it. And I, I saw, you know, some of the best uh, at this. Um, I think if, if, if the Republicans take the House, and I think their chances of doing so is probably a little better, just, a, just maybe a, just a tad better than 50-50 hmm. at this point. Um, I think that, that the question becomes, will they push extremist legislation? Will they push um, more tax cuts, more corporate tax cuts? I mean, we've already cut the tax rate, the corporate tax rate from 7.6% to 5.9%. This, was, this, is, this is Susanna's big accomplishment. Who benefits? Exactly. Who benefits? Uh, who will sacrifice? Mm -hmm. Uh, we've seen what's happened in Kansas, where uh, Governor Brownback's deep tax cuts have, you know, they don't have any money. They, they've, 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 lost their, uh, they've lost their reliable revenue stream in Kansas. Oklahoma, um, w between tax cuts and, 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 a, and another state with failed education reform, you've got 4,000 third graders who won't be moving on to the fourth grade oh, this fall. 4,000. Now this uh, this apparently has done something to Oklahoma parents, um, <laughs> which to use it to say it euphemistically are excited about this, yes. uh, and not in a good way, and not not in a in a in a good way. So, as we've seen in recent years, when the New Mexico House when the margin narrows, Democrats thirty seven, Republicans thirty three. As that margin has narrowed over the years, it used to be a wider margin. As that as that margin is narrowed, the House has become more partisan, mm -hmm. and um, yes, the work gets done sometimes at the eleventh hour. Yes, um, the work gets done, um, but there is a more partisan complexion to this House at the moment. Um, so, and we've seen both parties, you know, often vote in blocks to force the other side to vote no on legislation, to make them vote, um, to, to, to make them, to get them on the record. So you have, you have all stripes in, in the, in the, in the New Mexico house, but what I think, and also if the, if the Republicans take, um, the house, and I, I, again, I think, and I'm. This is real speculation, because this this is a horse race. Um, I think that you're going to see the necessity of a coalition. Uh -huh. uh, the necessity of a coalition, um, maybe involving the Senate as well. The necessity. We have those now. I mean, but they're. They're, they're relatively momentary with respect to discrete bills. Right, 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 right. But I, I think you're going to see, uh, uh, if, the, if the repubs take the House, I think you're going to see the necessity of a coalition, uh, the kind of thing we saw in the 80s. So could you give us a rundown on those uh, 10 House seats that are, uh, that are swings? I've, um, I've identified about 10 House districts. That I consider to be swing, uh, maybe up in the air, um, and and I think that let me say first that I think the Republicans have a shot uh, at taking the House because th number one, this is a midterm election. Um, there is no Barack Obama heading a national ticket, and there is not, in my judgment, I mean it's 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 not anything that I'm happy about. But, but there's not a, a, a strong, particularly strong Democratic or Republican gubernatorial candidate this year. 
which produces, I'd say, um, in that from that governor's race, pr- probably short coattails. Um, for uh, candidate King and for and for Governor Martinez. Also, you have a very, very, very um, sour, to pick a word, national mood. Um, people are afraid. They're anxiety ridden. They're angry. They're watching uh, events overseas. They're continuing to see a, a, a weak economy in America, despite some progress, certainly since 2008. Um, the national mood is anti-politician. It is anti-leadership. It is, as we've said, argumentative. It's anti-Washington. It's indeed, I'm, I'm sorry to say, it's anti-government. That's the mood. And this permeates you know, all the way down to these house races. Absolutely. Um, and as I said, Democrats have more seats to defend. So that is sort of behind my, the, the slightly better than 50-50 chance that the, the Republicans will take the House. So let's look at some, let's look at some races. Out in, out in McKinley County, um, I think it's in McKinley County, House District 4, um, there is a Republican out there um, whose name is extremely difficult to pronounce, and I, I don't want to be, I don't want to in any way offend anyone, or, or it's serious, it's, it's a very difficult name. Klatschi um, Sechiliage, uh, it's a woman, a Republican, who beat um, Representative Begay. In, in what's always been a Democratic district. That one is swing. Swing again. Um, in House District 24, Conrad James, uh, a Republican, he's trying to regain his seat against Democratic incumbent Elizabeth Thompson. Swing. Paul Pacheco in House District 23 is uh, a Republican and vulnerable, um, as near as I can tell. Also out in Valencia County, there is um, uh, in House District 7, uh, Representative Fajardo, who's a woman, um, is also um, vulnerable, let's say, as an incumbent. These are all, all the incumbents here are, in these swing districts are, I would say, to some degree vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Um, In House District 15, which is, which was formerly held for a long time by um, House Speaker Raymond Sanchez. Uh, and then here in the North Valley, uh, Emily Kane is a Democratic incumbent who, um, and I don't know who's running against her, but but that will be a, I think will be a close race. Um, in Democrat, in House District 53, uh, Rick Little, the Republican is running against Maria Elena Johnson, who's the Democrat. Now this is in Doniana, Doniana County, and this is the old district that was held by Nick Cote, um, a Democratic incumbent who who is not, for uh, whatever reasons, is not running um, this year. It, it makes it an open, it makes it an open seat, uh, in a in a again in a traditionally Democratic uh, district. So between open seats and and um, uh, the Democrats having more seats to defend. You have this. You have this. You have this rather up in the air situation. Um, in House District Thirty Six, Andy Nunez, uh, who's a Democrat who's running as a Republican, you probably read right, about this, right, right. Um, is up against Phil Archuleta, who is the who is the Democrat in that race, and I believe that's down south. Um, I'm guessing here, I think maybe around Hatch, but it's a bigger area than that, obviously. In Los Alamos, um, Stephanie Garcia, the Democrat, House District 43, uh, is vulnerable because of, of a very popular Republican by the name of Jeff Rogers in Los Alamos. Um, again, a, a toss-up. 
but he uh, probably has the the edge. In in Rhonda King's old district, wow. Gary King, Rhonda King, um, you have Susanna Martinez appointee Republican Vicky Perea, right, uh, who was appointed to that seat, and uh, she's being uh, challenged by Matthew McQueen, uh, a man I don't I don't know, the Democrat. But there, there's a chance for a, um, there's a good chance for the Democrats in that, in that district. Um, House District 37, you have Terry, Terry McMillan, the Republican, who lost his seat in the, re, in the Obama sweep mm -hmm. in 08. Um, now running against a, a woman who I don't know, a Democrat by the name of Joanne uh, Ferrari. So there are 10 um, that are up in the air, swing, if you will. Um, and it's very hard, frankly, to, to get a handle on these these house, these very local uh, districts. But there, are, some of the factors that I've mentioned to you earlier apply to these districts. Sure um, and but the, I think the big thing is is if if the the Repubs win in the House, um, there will be the need for a coalition. So we have time for th three more questions. Um, one is I'd like you to go back now and re uh, appraise the democratic problem in New Mexico at the moment. I'd like you then to talk a little bit about, uh, and I'll ask you a more specific question about these gubernatorial debates or this debate or why there aren't more debates or and all of that and what the possible outcomes might be of those debates. And five, I'd like to get your predictions of, uh, the, of, of the November outcome, particularly in the gubernatorial race. Let's talk about the uh, let's talk about the the Democrats. Yeah. Um, not so much in the nation, although there there are elements of the things I'm going to talk about at both the national level and the in the in the state level. Um, I was asked the other day by. A, by a woman who I regard highly and respect, um, she asked me why why um, the Republicans seem so much more energized. Mm. And politically, tactically, so so much more aggressive than, than the Democrats. Why do the Republicans, why are they so much more aggressive, so much more energized, it seems, to her? And I think that's a fair yeah, observation. Yeah. And so, so tactically, so much more on the march than than the Democrats. Um, there are probably a number of reasons for this, but I think one of them is uh, the Democrats' problem. For uh, really since 1940, um, the Democrats have relied on being able to provide economic security to all of their constituencies, or most of them. Um, and, you know, the, the corporate Democrats, if you will, the Wall Streeters, and what we used to call big business, um, they were always in the midst of economic security. But... Most other Democratic constituencies were not. In fact, many of them are, are traditionally economic ins economically insecure. This is the Democrats' challenge. Um, since 1940, the debate has always been, I think the big debate, the largest macro debate, has always been um, economic growth, which everybody talks about, versus aggressive redistribution. In other words, yes, growth yes, yes. versus distribution in the, in the, in the macro economy. Um, the Democrats have to be able to arrest, at the moment, the downward spiral of not only middle class folks, but they have to be able to arrest the, 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 the downward spiral in the lives of most Americans. Yes. They have to be able to arrest that. And they have to be able to, to make 
Americans, economic lives especially, better? Big problem. It's a big problem because because of the condition of the economy, and and I think because the uh, because of how the Republicans play the game, both in Congress um, and in the New Mexico legislature. Um, I mean, they're 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 I, in my judgment, they're they're destroying the country, but they play the game pretty well, tactically, strategically. Um, they've managed to to bottle up and uh, to the point of dysfunction in the government, uh, an American president. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, so while I, I don't take any joy in that, um, from a tactical, strategic standpoint, the Republicans have done have done well vis-a-vis -vis the Democrats on this question of how do we continue to improve the lives of Americans, stop, arrest the, the downward spiral, and and um, um, not only produce economic growth, but, but to um, redistribute. And that may be a bad word in some quarters, a naughty word in some quarters, but, but um, that is in part what it's about particularly in a zero-sum economy. The Democrats have problems with this. So this is their challenge. In a globalized economy, um, the Democrats' mantra, President Kennedy's mantra, of a rising tide raises all boats, lifts all boats, um, simply doesn't cut it anymore. Yeah. And um, it no longer applies. Throw in the decline of unions, the serious, precipitous decline in unions, uh, which weakens bargaining power of labor vis-a-vis -vis management. I mean, we don't have to go into that. We know, we know what's happening. Um, and the Republicans have been able to, to um, essentially stop the ability of the Democrats to reward and placate traditional democratic constituencies, which is the name of the game. You have to be able to reward and placate your constituencies, your base, if you will. Yeah. And this has become, not only has it been traditionally a democratic endeavor, democratic party endeavor, but, but it, is, it is the name of the game for all Americans. Economic growth and security in your life. This is very hard. Now, Democrats often talk about their growing demographics, their constituencies that are growing. Latinos, Asians, uh, millennials, professionals. And they, and they are growing. But as we can see when we look at economic factors and what the Democrats have to do, um, growing demo demographics in growing constituencies that are traditionally democratic are, n are not going to be enough. It's not enough. Particularly when you throw in the fact that we still don't get Hispanic voting at a level that where it needs to be. Um, we get professionals, and we still haven't gotten, obviously, millennials to vote after 2008. The Obama movement sort of slowed down right. after 2008, which included a lot of millennials at that time. So that demographics and growing traditional, growing traditional Democratic constituencies are not enough um, to 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 offer another cliche from James Carville. It really is the economy, stupid for Democrats. It really is. I mean, Obama talks about it in, the ter the, in terms of the middle class. And he's right. But it, it is, quote unquote, the economy stupid, as, as um, James Carville told us uh, a long time ago, it seems. So I, what, what, what should Democrats do? I mean, uh, I, I think that Democrats need to get, um, need to talk more about, even more about working people. And less, oddly enough, about the middle class. Um, I think they need to stop straddling class divisions. <laughs> and, 
and get a lot more energized and a lot angrier and a lot more aggressive, a la Elizabeth Warren. Yes. And they need to wage, and I, 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 I use this advisedly, this phrase, but they need to wage class warfare and stop straddling class divisions. They need to be much more aggressive um, if they want to uh, overcome what, what has been a, a really a great struggle for the Democrats in the economic realm, economic security realm, a great, a great struggle. So we might, we might translate some of this into the, into the governor's race and talk a little bit about voting behavior. I know we have a situation of cynicism and apathy, but, but how can a political party who so blatantly and obviously champions a tiny majority of wealthy people and they're a tiny minority of wealthy people, I meant to say. How can they translate that into a message that appeals to people who do not have a lot of money? How can they, how do they, uh, I guess it's a class, how do they talk to, uh, uh, to classes in such a way that convince them, that hoodwink them into thinking they're going to do them some good? Well, I'll tell you how. And in a moment, I'll tell you how Susanna Martinez did it in, in 2010. And um, maybe a little bit about the future in terms of this governor's raise. Um, I, I think that, that I think we need to be careful not to overestimate or um, overindulge um, a certain kind of, I think, very wrongful Republican success. In other words, I, I don't want to. I don't want to get carried away here with right. tactical and strategic praise for the Republicans. Right. <laughs> but they have achieved some success, and and I, they've done it through all, all of the old ways, going way back to um, Roger Ailes with with Richard Nixon, and uh, continuing through Lee Atwater, and and on through. Um, Bush's brain, what was his name? Yeah. Uh, with with by using race, by using by using class division, by using um, fear, and and very often by by capturing the South pretty much, by taking the South from the hands of uh, conservative Democrats, uh, segregationists in in a lot of cases. Um, by using race and fear, fear of crime, fear of terrorism. Uh, and they've also had a lot, a lot of money uh, to, to spend. So have the Democrats. Not as much. And that's the case in this governor's race, too, where the, where the financing is extremely lopsided in favor of, uh, of Governor Martinez. Uh, so those are the things that, that are, and, 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 and frankly, a very effective use of media, very effective use of corporate media. Um, and an America that continues to be low information, not much interested in paying attention, um, still seeking entertainment under, you know, under every bed uh, in media. And, and um, it's those kinds of things, but I, I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to overestimate that, all of that. Um, I can tell you how Susanna was successful Please in 2010. Do. I think. I think she may be still working some of these factors, these few factors, in in a, in a couple of, in varying degrees. Um, remember, you know that Susanna Martinez, who I I think is, our nothing special governor. There's nothing special about. This governor, nothing, really. Um, Susanna Martinez won in 2010 with no governing experience. No governing experience. Yeah, she was a prosecutor, and, um, but that's not governing. That's prosecuting, and in an issueless campaign in 2010. If you think back. 
And she also managed to parlay uh, a very subtle anti-immigrant sentiment True. in 2010. Still exists. But she was able to trade on that, particularly in getting Democratic crossover votes up north. Um, it may seem illogical or maybe even irrational or maybe not. But there, there are many, particularly older conservative Hispanics who um, are, are somewhat anti-immigrant, it seems to me. She traded on that. Uh, also, there was, with all respect to um, the Democratic gubernatorial candidate, in with every respect and fondness, um, the Democratic candidate for governor in 2010 was was not a strong one. It gives me no joy in saying that, but but I think uh, it was true. Run by a campaign run at the top by by people who were not New Mexicans. Sometimes that makes a difference. Um, but that seems to be the trend uh, anyway. Also, it was a midterm. A very fateful yeah, election true. in 2010, which was disaster for the Democrats. I mean, this that fateful election year of 2010, midterm election, is put us in the position we are in nationally today. Right. And down through the state houses into the legislatures. Um, so, and this is another one. And this is, this is shaping up to be a, a similar midterm, if you will. Uh, if we look at this race, uh, Attorney General King and Governor Martinez, we see essentially the same, the, the same candidate. We see an incumbent with a very, very weak, thin record. Um, who's reading from a Republican script, uh, a national GOP script, with, with um, um, fueled by national ambitions, national aspirations. The Republican Party has told her, and maybe even they, they may believe it, that this candidate is, this candidate is going places nationally depending on how the, uh, the national scene, uh, despite her denials, I think, and I think she believes it. Um, I, think she, I think she believes that. If she is reelected, um, I think she becomes Scott Walker Light, the governor of Wisconsin, who's um, aggressively gone after unions, uh, and is a, is a favorite child of, of corporate America, and including the Koch brothers. Also, I think she'll go after public pensions if she's, if she's elected. Not to eliminate them, but I think that, that it's very good politics these days to, to attack public pensions. Uh, by by state employ or state or public employees, very good politics. Certainly has been in Wisconsin, yeah. um, and and collective bargaining. I think there'll be a, a an assault. I think you'll see right to work again oh raise its its head, and I think you'll see a push for it here in in New Mexico in a state where where unions. Um, maybe with the exception of, of teachers' unions, public employee, maybe, uh, are weak, are extremely weak to begin with. We fought this battle in, in the 1980s when Governor King, Bruce King, uh, essentially blocked or stopped a right-to-work effort in New Mexico. Um, part of his legacy. So, you know, I, I think that... that, that you see states like Oklahoma, Kansas, Wisconsin as uh, maybe not models for this governor and her Republican script uh, played out by Republican consultants in a, what, what appears to be her bunker on the fourth floor in the roundhouse. Um, this, her closest staff are, are political 
consultants and operatives. Uh, where are the, and here's a name out of the past, where are the Maryland Bud Keys right. in the governor's office? Okay. Where are the Franklin Joneses? Regardless of party, regardless of partisan, where are they? Where are those who, who understand um, governing? Not just managing the government or not just administering the government. You know, get the budget done and uh, that sort of thing. But, but actually governing. Uh, some states are well, are well run, but poorly governed. Some states are almost well governed, but poorly led. The name of the game is still governance. How do you, how do you combine a well-run state with leadership? Um, how do you do that? And that's what I think this governor is not, is not provided. Question becomes, can, can uh, a challenger, Gary King, provide it? Beyond a kind of um, um, uh, old Democratic Party centrism and moderation that he probably sees as the way to get elected in a generally conservative state. Um, Gary King faces the old, oldest problem. He, he, he faces the problem of process versus substance. In other words, there are, there are candidates for public office who can master the process. They can get elected, but they can't govern, or they don't do it very well. And then you have the people who, who would be great governors lowercase g, but there's no way they're going to be elected. This is, this is what I call the Ray Powell syndrome. Ray Powell, um, a very able man, a Democrat, um, thought to be possibly a successor to Bruce King. This is Sr. Ray Powell Sr. Yes, indeed, Ray Powell Sr., who, a very able man, um, but it was... It was very, very difficult for a man like that, very able, to master the electoral process. Gary King faces the same thing. If you, if you, uh, if you get around the state and you talk to people and you, you, know, you talk about this, you find that, and I hope I'm wrong, um, you find very little enthusiasm. Keeping in mind an old and tried and true joke, that I am always wrong in making election predictions, and that to some degree uh, you and I are twins in that matter. Could you give us a, a prediction on four races? The gubernatorial uh, 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 lieutenant governor race, the auditor's race, actually five, the secretary of state's race, and the land commissioner's race. For your predictions, and, and prompt me as to the races themselves, so I know which ones I'm talking about. The governor's race, um, I think the, it, we're in the late innings, and um, Susanna Martinez has a lead, but not an insurmountable lead. Um, I, I think that despite some not enough enthusiasm for Gary King and not enough money, um, and, and, the, and the sort of the, the diminishment of the Bruce King legacy, Despite all that, um, I, I would predict that Gary King will win in a in a close race for state auditor. I, I think I think Tim Keller will will cruise to a to a relatively easy victory in the Secretary of State's race. I believe that's Diana Duran and Maggie Toulouse. Um, I think I think here again Maggie Toulouse. Um, will win for the attorney general um, Hector I think there I'm also going to predict uh, I believe I predicted a, a democratic sweep with uh, Hector Balderas winning that race winning the attorney general's race and lastly uh, state land commissioner state land commissioner I, I'm, I'm going to go with I mentioned, I mentioned Ray Powell Sr. earlier so I'm going to mention Ray Powell Jr. In predicting that Ray Powell will win 
the land commissioners raise. Well, Richard, I hope the old joke doesn't hold true. It's been a wonderful conversation. As always, you bring things so succinctly and you make things so clear for these these really complicated matters, which we, which I don't think, uh, uh, they're not thought well about anymore, but you think very well about them, and I'm very grateful to you. Hope we see you again closer to the election. Thank you very much, Barrett. It's always a pleasure. Uh, always a pleasure to see you and uh, talking about my favorite subject.